Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Joan Reed. I'm Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School. And I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Harvard Affiliated Surgical Subspecialties Residency Programs. The mission of the Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership, otherwise known as DICP, is to advance diversity, inclusion in health, biomedical, behavioral, and STEM fields in ways that build individual and institutional capacity to achieve excellence, foster innovation, and ensure equity in health locally, nationally, and globally. Today's program is part of the visiting clerkship program in our office, DICP office. For 30 years, UCP has been a model of excellence, offering outstanding medical students, particularly those from groups underrepresented in medicine, an opportunity to participate in externships at Harvard Medical School and its affiliated hospitals. Since its inception, more than 1,500 students have completed VCP, the Visiting Clerkship Program. Unfortunately for this academic year, VCP has been drastically impacted by COVID-19. We recognize that there's a lot of uncertainty in what the upcoming application cycle for residency might look like. Many students have expressed concern about the possibilities of what the future could hold, and therefore we've decided to host a series of webinars to bring members of our HMS affiliated residency programs together with medical students to share ideas, provide support, address questions on moving forward in the next stages of your medical training and the application process, and to really address also questions about away rotations and where that stands. This is the fourth of these webinars bringing together our residency program uh, representatives and directors. Today you'll be hearing from subspecialties of otolaryngology, ophthalmology, and orthopedic surgery. I'm going to um, introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Alden Landry, who is an assistant dean in our Office of Diversity and Community Partnership. He's also an emergency medicine physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Dr. Landry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reed, for um, the welcome and thank you for joining us to all of those who are in our audience. And I just wanna say thank you to the students for uh, participating in this webinar. Uh, just to re reiterate what Dr. Reed said, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty that's what hap what's happening with the academic uh, season and the interview process. And we wanted to make sure that uh, the students uh, who were interested in our programs had an opportunity to learn from us. And even though we don't have the opportunity to host you on campus as part of our business clerkship program, we do wanna make sure that we are able to engage with you, introduce you to our programs, and allow you to get some of those really important questions answered that you would have typically had answered uh, during the uh, application season. Next slide. So just to give everyone a quick overview of what we're going to be doing, uh, this is going to be a Q&A uh, based session where our speakers are going to talk from their experiences as program directors or associate program directors here at HMS. Uh, all of your lines are muted and the chat function is disabled. However, we do encourage you to interact with our uh, participants um, by using the uh, Q&A section of the panel. Um, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available through our website uh, shortly afterwards. Uh, so please take advantage of that as well. Next slide. Uh, as Dr. Reed mentioned, unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we've uh, had to suspend our uh, visiting clerkship program. Uh, that being said, we are going to offer this and a few other programs uh, throughout the rest of the summer and into the interview season uh, to really help to engage students, uh, to encourage them to think more uh, about our programs that we have here to offer at Harvard Medical School and the affiliated institutions. Next slide. Uh, so with this, what I would like to do is just introduce our panelists. Uh, I'll give you their names and their titles, uh, and then I'm going to allow them an opportunity to, to introduce their programs. I think it's really important that you hear from them about what they're proud of about their programs, uh, what they think is unique about their programs, and things that they think you all should know uh, that really highlight the strengths of their program. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Bono. Uh, he's the Executive Vice Chair for the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and he's the Associate Program Director for the Harvard Combined Orthopedic Residency Program. Next will be Dr. Stacy Gray. She's an Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Education um, at Mass Ioneer Institute, and she also serves as the Residency Program Director for the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Harvard Medical School. Uh, next, I wanna introduce Dr. Sharuk Jalisi. 
He's the chief of uh, otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and he's the residency program director at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, and last is Dr. Alice Lorch. Uh, she is the Associate Chief of Quality for the Department of Ophthalmology uh, at Mass Massachusetts Eye and Ear, and she also is the Director of the Ophthalmology Residency Training Program uh, at Harvard Medical School. And so with that, I will um, turn it over to our first um, Program Director. Uh, next slide. And uh, it's going to be uh, Dr. Bono, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about the orthopedic program uh, at uh, Beth, uh, excuse me, at the Harvard Combined Emergency Medicine Residency, uh, uh, orthopedic residency. Thank you very much, and and that's why we gave it the acronym H Corp because it's too it's too long to say. Um, <laughs> what what H Corp uh, in, in involves is a number of different hospitals. Uh, it's pretty it's fairly unique within the Harvard system in that you we we have our residents rotating through. Mass General, Brigham and Women's, Beth Israel, uh, and Children's Hospital. There's also uh, a history of rotating through uh, a, one of the local VAs, which may also be brought back uh, into the program. But amongst the, these four major hospitals, we've got an executive committee that is assembled from representatives from chairs, and the program director who is George Dyer, who I am uh, very inadequately replacing uh, right now, we're filling in for uh, George oversees, or Dr. Dyer oversees the entire program amongst all the different hospitals. It's a rather large program. We have 12 residents a year. It's a five-year program um, as, uh, as any other orthopedic program. There are a few that are six years, um, but the, um, the, the depth and breadth of the, of the rotations that you will go through really will give you a full aspect of, of orthopedic surgery. Um, it, it, orthopedic surgery is um, a historically a, not a very diverse um, group of physicians, and uh, what, what Dr. Dyer has, has really done over the years is uh, made particular efforts to address that, and, and I think that our current, future, and, and immediately past complement of, of uh, residents and graduates reflect this. Uh, there's also uh, huge opportunities that, that Dr. Dyer has fostered for uh, outreach both within the community here in Boston, but also uh, inter, in, into um, international medicine, underserved areas of the world that, um, that he uh, has overseen. We've, we've seen many of our graduates uh, participate that, in that. They've taken a year off of the clinical aspect of residency and spent a year abroad uh, in, in various places in the world to, uh, to address these issues. And this has been the basis of thesis projects and ongoing research. Great, thank you, Dr. Bono. We look forward to hearing uh, some of your comments uh, when we get to the Q&A section. Uh, next, I wanna bring it to uh, Dr. Gray. Uh, and She could talk about uh, the um, Otolaryngology Residency Program at Massachusetts Eye and Ear. Well, first, uh, thank you for, for having me. This is um, a new format for this, but uh, certainly really uh, welcome the opportunity to have, a, uh, have the chance to talk to so many medical students. So really, uh, thank you for having us. And I'll go uh, to my slides. Um, the uh, Department of Otolaryngology, and specifically, I think one of the things that's different about uh, Massachusetts Eye is just that it's been around for a very long time um, and has had a residency really since uh, the mid-1800s. Um, and I, I, I love uh, history of medicine, and um, we have a great collection of old photos. Um, and uh, sort of when house officers really first started working and specifically in otolaryngology, actually ophthalmology and otolaryngology used to be combined training in the early 1800s. Um, the house officers received room board uniforms and $50 a year. And obviously things are uh, very different now. I'll have my next slide. Uh, this is our current uh, cadre of residents. We have uh, 27 residents total in our program. And I'll go to the next slide. Oh, I think there's one that we missed. We can go backwards. Great. 
So um, as with orthopedics, it's typically five years of training. Um, and the first year is a mixture of uh, six months of otolaryngology and six months of other programs and uh, other um, rotations like general surgery and oral surgery, plastic surgery, and neurosurgery, which have a lot of uh, combined um, clinical applications with otolaryngology. Um, at Mass Sinear, we actually have two separate uh, tracks for training. We have four residents every year that do a five-year clinical uh, track, and then we have one resident every year that does an extra two years of research, which is completed between the PGY-2 and PGY-3 year. Um, and there are not that many programs in the United States uh, within otolaryngology that offer that extra uh, research training. So that's something that um, we have uh, really enjoyed having an opportunity for residents within otolaryngology to get a little bit more training within research. Um, even for the residents that do the five-year uh, clinical track, we have um, 20 weeks of, of research built into the residency program, and that is a big component, I think, of what uh, part of what we do. The other thing that I did want to mention that is um, a highlight for our program is um, within otolaryngology, um, uh, global surgery actually is a field that is fairly new um, and developing. And uh, we're fortunate to have a large number of faculty that are very interested in global surgery. Um, and we have designed an elective rotation during the chief year of residency where residents are able to spend at least two weeks on a dedicated um, trip with some of our faculty, um, some of whom spend up to four months um, outside of the United States uh, during a clinical year. And that's um, another thing that I think is a little bit unique about our program. And then my last slide is simply um, just information for following us on both Twitter and um, Instagram. And I am more than happy to talk to people as well so I can make my email address available for anybody who is uh, interested in more information about our program. But I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Uh, and next we're gonna turn to Dr. Jalisi. Uh, again, he's the uh, residency program director for otolaryngology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Dr. Jalisi. Thank you, uh, Alden, and thank you for organizing this. Really happy to be here, and thank you for the participants for taking the time. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the, the new Beth Israel Deaconess Medical School, uh, Medical Center, Harvard Medical School program. If you switch to the next slide, please. We can switch over. So we obviously have our, I'm the program director. We have a couple of uh, associate program directors, Dr. James Naples and Dr. Caradonna. And then we have a program coordinator, Kelly Barnes. Uh, next slide. So our program is the newest one. So uh, uh, Dr. Gray talked about the uh, oldest program in the U United States, I think, which is a top-notch program. And uh, we are unique in the sense that we have one department of otolaryngology at Harvard Medical School, but we are now hosting two residencies. And we're excited to really do that with the residents rotating through Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, which is a tertiary care program in Boston uh, Children's Hospital, where all the residents in the city from all the uh, programs rotate through. Uh, Beth Israel has a very diverse breadth of uh, otolaryngology pathology training, where residents, our strength is going to be uh, resident-centric education. We got approval in April. We just matched our first group of interns because of the diverse experience that was happening throughout the whole department. Uh, and hence, we created this residency. We have a diverse faculty. Everyone's coming from a different institution, which I think is the strongest part of our program, in addition to the large uh, training opportunities that you have. Um, not one faculty has been trained in the same institution, so the residents learn from different people. Uh, we are resident-centric. We don't have uh, fellows or any other additional learners uh, uh, as of yet. Uh, that uh, allows for very focused training for the residents. Uh, and I think in these initial years, as we develop this program, there's a huge opportunity for the residents to evolve, to help evolve the curriculum with the faculty leadership, uh, making us a very innovative program because we have to bring us in line with uh, the latest uh, techniques of education and residency training, which continue to evolve. Every year, they have changed. Uh, next slide. Uh, we do have six months of research. Uh, we do, uh, as part of the Department of Surgery over here, we do have a facilitating innovative research and surgical trials, which is a core uh, program for the residents or any faculty to take advantage of, where you have uh, basically uh, epidemiologists and biostatisticians uh, and people who can help you with the RRBs. Uh, we're part of the surgical program in innovation. And then we've uh, started our own uh, surgical ordering simulation program through our simulation center. Uh, there's resident 
uh, partnership that we envision in educational planning at all aspects. So it's a different uh, part of learning uh, how to develop a curriculum uh, because uh, we are a new program. And there are global health partnerships that uh, you can get involved in as Dr. Gray suggested. Uh, but there's a limitation on how much time you can spend uh, outside of uh, your core uh, institution of training. Uh, so that's uh, it. I think there's one more slide or that's, that's my last slide. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, uh, well, we are in the process of setting up our Twitter and Instagram account. Uh, we have to go through the process at Beth Israel, but as soon as I come out, I can give it to uh, Fari who can disseminate it to you folks. But otherwise you can email me. I'll make my email available. Anything you guys want to talk about, I'm happy to talk. We're very excited to start this uh, program. Very excited about a new interns who joined us uh, uh, from Cleveland Clinic and UT Memphis. Uh, and we hope to uh, produce the leaders of the, of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jalisi. Uh, and next, we're going to go to uh, Dr. Lorch, uh, who again is the program director for ophthalmology uh, at Massachusetts Eye and Ear. Dr. Lorch. Thank you. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today and talk a little bit about the program, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, like orthopedics, we are a Harvard-wide program in ophthalmology. So we um, see patients at the Brigham, Mass General, the BI, the VA, Children's. Um, and in addition, we actually have opportunities to go to India and see patients in our Vind Eye system there. So we have a very um, sort of diversity of experiences in our program, which is something that I think is particularly unique to us and we're proud of. Um, another thing that's sort of unique to the clinical experience that you get at the Harvard Ophthalmology Program is our emergency room. Um, so we have one of three eye-only emergency rooms in the country. And this is something that um, really brings a lot of patients from all over the world to us and allows for a diversity of pathology that really adds to the, to the, the things that we see Harvard-wide. Um, so I think that's something that, that really distinguishes us from other ophthalmology programs. In terms of structure, we're, we're a big program. So we have eight residents a year. Um, right now we have PGY twos, threes, and fours. So people do their internship elsewhere. Um, but there's a big push now in ophthalmology to get internships integrated into ophthalmology programs. Um, and so for those of you who are interested in ophthalmology, you'll see more about this. We, in July of 2021, are going to start by having an integrated internship program with Newton Wellesley Hospital, which is a hospital within our partner system that's linked to our EMR. Um, and we're really excited about that partnership. Um, I would say above being a clinician and, and, and sort of be training excellent clinicians, one of the focuses of our program is really to train leaders. Um, and this can be in a range from clinical work to research, to advocacy, to global health and to teaching. And so we really try to individualize our program and provide the resources that people need to, to really become leaders in those fields. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, this is sort of the pictures of some of the resources we have. Some of the things we like to highlight is our surgical training program. So you can see pictures here of some of our, our trainees operating as well as our surgical training labs and then our residents in the corner just having fun. And then next slide. Um, and something I, I also like to highlight is that our, our program is very much a community. Um, so we have a big residency program and then a big faculty to match that. Um, and so residents are assigned formal mentors um, but also develop a lot of mentorship relationships. Um, and as much as residents rely on faculty for mentorship and education, our faculty over and over again say that they really rely on residents to be curious to ask questions and to sort of foster an environment of innovation and new ideas. Our program is very dynamic and we're constantly trying to change based on feedback from um, faculty and residents. So despite the fact that we're very old, as Dr. Gray um, highlighted, we're always trying to, to make improvements to our program. This is a team of people that we have who think about those improvements. So with me, um, we have, um, just to point out a few people, we have Dr. Jim Chodosh, who's been very involved um, as our Director of Diversity and Inclusion. We have a Director of Residency Wellness and a Director of, of, of um, Research. So we have a sort of a large team of people who are thinking about changes that we can make in education and, and how we can be innovative in doing that. And just before we move on to, to the Q&A, which I know is what everyone's interested in, I just want to also um, to say again that I know this is a very disconcerting time for medical students and that things are very unusual this year um, and that we are, as program directors, very much thinking about that and, and willing to answer any questions and have you reach out as much as you need to be comfortable in this process. So like everyone else, I'm happy to, to answer any individual questions as things move forward. Wonderful. And uh, so thank you, Dr. Lorch, for that. And what I, what I appreciate the most about everything that I've heard from all of our panelists um, is the openness and willing, willingness to communicate with uh, 
students during this difficult time. And hopefully this webinar will help um, set aside some of the uh, uh, concern about this application process, knowing that it's gonna be impossible given how stressful this process already is uh, and the uniqueness that we're uh, dealing with during the COVID-19 pandemic and all of its ramifications. Um, and I just wanna say uh, for all of the students that are listening in, I think it's really important that you um, hear how open these program directors are in communicating. And I think that's um, one thing that uh, people often have concerns about is uh, um, building rapport and relationships with program directors. Uh, and I think that uh, all of these individuals who are on the call with us have already started to express that they're willing to open up, uh, communicate with you all, whether it's through social media or through email uh, to build those relationships. All right, so with that, I really want to just get into the heart of this discussion, and I have um, a, a series of questions that we're going to ask each of the, the panelists, uh, and uh, I'm going to go to you, Chris, uh, first. Uh, from, from a program director's perspective, um, what are your overall thoughts about this application process and how, uh, how different it's going to be compared to years prior? Yeah, these are good questions, and I was just perusing some of the questions that have been asked so far about uh, staying regionally because of uh, maybe travel restrictions. Um, you know, what, what needs to be considered is that everybody across the country is going to be experiencing the same thing. You, you feel like you're going to be restricted because your own school seems to be placing some restrictions, but there are restrictions across the board. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily change your, your, the geographical scope of, of how wide you apply uh, because of, of any current or, or expected future travel restrictions. And the reason for that is I believe that, that interviews may very well be um, virtual as well. So I think that, that if, if, we are, if, if you re restrict yourself geographically, and then in the end, you could have done all of these virtual interviews across the country. And I think you, you might regret that. So um, that's, that, that, that would be as far as what the interview and the selection process. I, I don't expect those things to be different. But what we really rely on heavily every year is the in-person uh, sub-internships or, or the rotations, these interview rotations. And we're actually in the process of developing a virtual clerkship. Um, so to speak, for non-HMS students, outside students, so that we can get to know you, you can get to know us, you can get to know the residents and get a real feel of, of, of what the program's like. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next question is gonna be for you, Stacey. Um, what are you doing to prepare um, yourself for this application uh, season? Um, and then also, what are you doing to, as a team and as a, as, uh, as a program with the, um, program coordinators and, and others who may be involved in the interview process and the application review process. How are you all preparing yourselves for this, uh, for this season? So I think that um, the first thing that I want to highlight is something that Dr. Lorch said before, which is that um, I have seen just a significant, I think this time is always very uh, anxiety provoking for students, for sure. And I have seen um, just with the added stress of uh, the changes, um, really that this has highlighted this much more. And as program directors, um, and this I'm speaking not just for myself, but for program directors in otolaryngology across the country, I think we really want to reassure students that we really do understand that this year is going to be very different. So we know that, for instance, the applications themselves are going to be very different, and we want to reassure students that it is okay, um, and we're looking at letters differently this year. We're really going to, I think, actually do a much more holistic review of the application. Um, you know, fortunately, our program has always done that, but I think most programs across the country are going to do the same as well. Um, the Otolaryngology Program Directors Organization and the Society of University Otolaryngologists um, that I happen to be involved in the leadership for that are really trying to figure out how we can do things nationally to really reassure students that we understand your anxiety, and we want to try to alleviate that as much as possible. We are also going through the learning process of how to use um, virtual applications in a way to let students know about our program, but we don't want that to actually increase anxiety. So for instance, we're trying to host webinar sessions, and certainly I think um, webinars like this are also very helpful too. But what I have seen is that some students then feel like they need to participate or that there's, their participation is somehow going to be tallied or looked at. And that's not the point of this. Really, the point of this is to try to let students see what our program is like. And 
truthfully, um, I actually think this year is a better opportunity because in the past, the resident, the applicants that really had a chance to do that were the ones that chose to come and do an away rotation with us. And this year, we're going to try to find ways to let um, applicants interact with our residents more and actually have access to our faculty. It won't be the same as in person, um, but certainly we have all learned that we can do many things over Zoom that we never thought we would be able to um, over the last uh, three months as, um, as sort of uh, clinicians as well. So um, I think my biggest message is just to try to limit anxiety for all of the students. It's already complicated enough. And so we really, we, we want um, applicants to know that we recognize that and we are going to do things differently this year. Thank you, Stacey. I think that's uh, a great sort of lead into the next question, which is for, for Alice, um, because you mentioned um, uh, about the stress and anxiety that students may have and sort of the, uh, the concern to log on to every webinar and, and make sure to, to interface with folks. Um, so uh, Alice, what are you hearing as far as uh, concerns from students, especially the ones that have already reached out to you uh, about their, um, their, their, their uh, issues with this upcoming application cycle? So I agree with um, Stacey, I mean, I think there's a lot of anxiety and to be totally honest, there's anxiety in the part of program directors too. We don't know how this cycle is going. Um, I think part of what our national um, group has done is been trying to be as transparent as possible as decisions are made. And so what I'd recommend to students is to try to stay on top of announcements that are being made by the national societies about changes that'll be in the, in the application cycle. Um, I think students also, I, I hear mostly two things. One is students not being sure they've had enough exposure to make a decision to go into ophthalmology in the first place. And then students being not sure they've had enough exposure to present a strong application into ophthalmology. Um, so we have some students who are deciding to take a year off to, to do this, but I think it's important to say that I don't think that's necessary. I think that um, in part, what Stacy said is true, that program directors are going to be considering applications differently this year. We know that the circumstances are different. We know that, that there's been a variety of different experiences for people across the country. Um, and so I think that we're cognizant of that and people shouldn't feel beholden to take time off um, to, to strengthen an application. We are, we are also at Harvard very much moving towards virtual experiences. And I think this will be increasingly common um, in other places. So we had a very successful virtual medical student rotation for credit in May. Um, and although we can't host virtual clerks of students coming back until well into next year, we're gonna be offering many things virtually. So we're gonna have virtual webinars that are open to everybody that are like this, but sort of on a smaller level with more detail on ophthalmology. Um, and we're also gonna be hosting mini rotations for students who don't have adequate access to ophthalmology in their own programs or don't feel like they have a way that they can really get to know ophthalmology and, and get letters and mentors. And we're gonna be having sort of mini rotations for people who express that kind of need to us. Um, and I, I think we're trying to be leaders in that, but I think it's gonna be increasingly common across the country too. And there'll be ways to, to get involved. A final way to get involved is um, through research. So certainly we can't have re students coming to us, but we can involve them in research projects um, even from afar. So. Great, thank you. Uh, and so this is a question really I have for all the panelists and it's something that I've seen popping up in, in the, in the uh, questions from the audience. Um, and so it's really, and I'll go with, with uh, you, uh, Sharuk and uh, go to the rest of the panelists next, but uh, what is your program doing to uh, increase diversity uh, in the program? And then also what is your program doing to engage uh, the um, typically disadvantaged populations here in Boston uh, and across the state? So thank you, Ordin. I think that's an important question for all of us. Uh, so at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, we work as a, as a big group, as you know, Ordin and for the participants. Uh, we do have something called the Shapira Institute for Education and Research, uh, which uh, has been very engaged in both uh, medical student and faculty education. Uh, they do uh, uh, sponsor a data science research program for the underrepresented minorities uh, and provide uh, funds for uh, up to a six week uh, training program for for research, uh, and that's primarily open to medical students uh, who are from an underrepresented minority. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, within the d division and within the hospital, we have many uh, programs uh, uh, addressing diversity topics such as unconscious bias, uh, healthcare equity, uh, gender equity, uh, and then we also host uh, lectures uh, to improve inclusion and diversity. 
Uh, we have formal training programs for uh, the trainees. Uh, we are engaged with the LGBTQ uh, programs in town. Uh, and then separately for the trainees who would uh, come into our program, uh, we have a very diverse population at Beth Israel. Uh, uh, we have uh, key uh, health centers such as Fenway Health, uh, where we see a lot of diverse populations. Uh, and we basically teach the resident how to effectively communicate and work with all patients of all backgrounds uh, on the principles of cultural sensitivity and compassion. Uh, there's a lot of uh, faculty role modeling uh, in the inpatient and outpatient setting. And uh, we've been uh, training residents for a long time as part of uh, the, the Mass Ionia program uh, and now as our independent program. So, you know, this is something uh, that is very core to our uh, uh, fundamentals for, for our program and for Beth Israel. So I hope that answers some of the questions of what we're doing. Great, thank you for that. Uh, I'll go to you, Stacey, uh, same question. So I think one of um, one of the things that um, we just most recently, obviously the last few weeks, um, there has been a significant um, unrest, unfortunately, in this country, um, which has sparked a lot of really interesting conversations um, in our department. And we have always, um, I think, valued obviously diversity and inclusion, um, but this has made us um, really think about ways that we can be more proactive. And um, we have a diversity and inclusion task force, but uh, the amount of um, discussion that has been generated over the last two weeks uh, for me has been um, very encouraging. And I think one of the th one of the ways that we're really we are really making a difference in this regard is on a on a national level. So one I think is including uh, medical students and specifically trainees in our own program um, who are very invested in trying to make a change because otolaryngology unfortunately really struggles with this problem on a national level. And the other is that we've recognized that we really need a network across the country. So involving program directors from all programs in the United States um, through the otolaryngology program directors organization really have created a network so that um, there are identified mentors in every single training program across the country um, that really has made this a focus of a component of, of their program. And so we are really sort of trying to work uh, nationally um, to help with this. Um, and I think that we won't be able to do it just as a singular institution, but I think if, um, if, if really sort of across uh, all of our departments in the country, recognizing that this is an issue, um, really trying to get more medical students engaged because otolaryngology is a very small field. Um, it's a very small surgical field. And unfortunately, students are often not exposed to it, even during their third year of medical school. And so what we're really trying to do is increase our outreach to medical students early on in training um, and really during the third year to provide um, some understanding of what we do as a specialty um, so that hopefully more people will take the opportunity to experience more about it and understand that specifically diversity and inclusion is something that we are really committed to um, as a field, um, really sort of making some dramatic changes. Um, and certainly it is, has always been a focus uh, within our department and also within the stronger department of, of Harvard Medical School. I think because it's such a large focus uh, for all of us, it's something that's just a natural component of what we do. Great, thank you for that. Um, I'll go to you, Chris, a uh, similar question. What, do you, what is uh, the combined orthopedics program doing to promote diversity and expose students uh, to provide, providing care for uh, typically disadvantaged groups? Yeah, so um, I would say that as far as the diversity of, of the program, um, we've, and I, when I say we, I really mean Dr. Dyer, George, has made tremendous strides in that. Um, in, and as I alluded to before, this is, our program is not representative of the typical program within the U.S. I, again, I think we struggle in orthopedics for diversity in general. Uh, I recently remember looking at a statistic of the of the number of African American orthopedic surgeons in the country, and it's it's just uh, abysmally low. Um, however, I don't think that's reflected in in the in the backgrounds of our current residents, and that is that has been a conscious decision. And and I say a conscious decision because it's at the selection level, um, at at the invitation level. It's a, it's 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 making 
making everyone feel welcome into a program so that those prospective students, you as the prospective students, recognize the, the Harvard program as a diverse program. Um, there are, that, that's both on, uh, on, on uh, a, a racial level as well as um, ethnic, other ethnicities. And as far as uh, our, our female representation, we, we've had years where half of our resident year has been female. That's unheard of within an orthopedic program if you look at any other uh, orthopedic pro program across the country. So the, that, that momentum that, that, uh, that has been created, that, that continues. As far as outreach to underserved areas, there are, there are uh, residents that are extremely interested in that and are engaged in these, in these uh, in, in local outreach programs uh, currently and, and are offered that and again that's that's being organized by uh, by Dr. Dyer on a, on a local level. Great and uh, we'll round it out with you Alice if you want to uh, finish up with this question. Sure um, so like otolaryngology a lot of these fields uh, the issue of diversity is a problem in ophthalmology so we have about six to eight percent of practicing ophthalmologists identify as underrepresented minorities when clearly the you know, the population is over a third. And so given this, it's actually been a, a priority for uh, ophthalmology nationally for the last four years. So four years ago, the American Academy of Ophthalmology started a program called the Minority Mentoring Program. Um, and our Vice Chair of Education, who's also our Director of Diversity and Inclusion, is on the board of that program and has really been a champion for it. So we've been very intimately involved with it. Um, and it's a program where medical students can attend national meetings, make mentorship relationships within ophthalmology. Every year we send um, some HMS students there and we have three who are going this year. Um, that effort has really expanded um, with the support of the HMS community. And so we now also sponsor um, visiting URN students into um, our rotations and offer them um, specific career advising. Um, Four years ago when the Academy of Ophthalmology started thinking about this and, and, and really putting together structural programs, we looked very critically at our selection process on um, how we could, could really value diversity as part of our selection. So now all of our residents, or all of our applications for residency who self-identify as URM go through an additional review by a committee to really make sure that the, the unique differences are, are appreciated and then everyone gets the same opportunity to earn an interview spot for our residency program. Um, and in addition, we educate our selection committee annually on unconscious bias and, and sort of related issues. Um, and I think the last thing that we've just in, uh, started this year that I already mentioned is really an effort to make sure that if we can't host clerkship students that we do that virtually. And so we're gonna have a push over the coming months to, to, offer, um, to offer virtual clerkships to people who either don't have programs or to underrepresented minority students that we can host them within our program um, and welcome them that, in that way. Um, in terms of working in disadvantaged communities, um, this has also been something that's really been blossoming as a result of telemedicine. So just in the last year, sort of before COVID started, we had started um, telemedicine screening programs and a lot in several different community health centers around Boston with support of our primary care um, partnerships at the Brigham and Mass General. And this is a way that we've really been able to bring ophthalmology into the communities something that our residents are increasingly interested in and and there's a lot of support from um, within our leadership so um, that's also been a, a really positive and interesting um, project to work on wonderful thank you um i'm going to turn to you sharuk uh, as we think about um students who are in the space where uh, they may come from an institution that isn't affiliated with a residency program and they're interested in otolaryngology uh, what advice do you have for those students and uh, what tips uh, should they, uh, or what, what should they be doing in order to prepare themselves, especially if they're applying during this, ac uh, this application cycle? Uh, so that's, that's an interesting dilemma uh, uh, that, uh, that all the students face. Uh, I, I would suggest that uh, the, the students should definitely rotate, especially if they don't have a department or division within their own hospital, to rotate with a local ordering oncologist. I think that's the first step in trying to figure out if you're even interested in the specialty, you know? Uh, ordering oncology, for the most part, when you start thinking about it, 80% of it is outpatient, and then you do uh, do surgery. It is a surgical specialty, and then there's a lot of procedures, the procedure-oriented uh, 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 specialty. Uh, but you need to figure that out if that's uh, the lifestyle you want to live. So work with uh, someone locally. Uh, beyond that, uh, I think it's always a good, a good idea, regardless of how good your uh, application is, 
especially if you're coming from somewhere where there's no ringology program, is to spend time with an established program or somewhere where there's a residency, whether you do research with them or you take a whole year off. Uh, I had a recent student who came from one of these programs where they had no local ringology program that did research with us and ended up successfully matching into a program. But uh, she, she took time to, uh, to invest in uh, learning a, a system and uh, really establishing a network. So I think that becomes important at the end of the day. You need to have people who can uh, write letters for you, uh, who can vouch for you, and, uh, and show that you're a good collaborator. So I think that's the important thing if you don't have a local program in your institution. Great. And a similar question for you, Alice, but uh, related to ophthalmology. And I know you mentioned already about the, uh, the virtual clerkships that you've established, but any other recommendations for students? Yeah, I've already said that twice, so I won't uh, promote those any further. Um, but yes, I think there's, I mean, there's an incredible amount of resources online that are available. So through the American Academy of Ophthalmology website, there's many different webinars about the application process, but also sort of the lives of ophthalmologists. So those are things you can tap into. Um, there are also a bunch of academic centers that have really great learning sites. I wish we were one of them, but I can talk about University of Iowa, University of Utah, are just great sites to go on that have a lot of Sort of resources about ophthalmology where you can just sort of learn about the the subject because I think like otolaryngology it's something that's hard to get a feel for, for um, in medical school otherwise. Um, the last thing I want to say is so for ophthalmology I think for the vast majority of programs this is going to be a virtual interview season I'm sure we'll talk more about it but I think one of the, the advantages of having a virtual interview season is that there's going to be a lot more transparency from programs trying to, to let you know what it's like to be part of their program. So even if you're not applying in this cycle, I think those are resources you can tap into. People are gonna be opening up their grand rounds. You can listen to grand rounds. They're gonna be having webinars. You can meet their faculty and meet their alumni. And so even if you're thinking about the field and you're not at the stage of applying, I would tap into this interview season as a way to learn more about the field and then sort of spot people who you think might be good mentors for you at different institutions and reach out to them. Thank you. And Chris, one of the strengths that we've had here at Harvard is the visiting clerkship program where we've been able to bring students on campus for uh, now 30 years to uh, do rotations with us. Unfortunately, that's not an option this season. Um, one of the things that students used uh, that time to do is uh, learn about our programs from the inside out. Um, how can students start to uh, learn about programs um, given that we aren't gonna have those opportunities for away rotations? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great point. So we actually had uh, we have a task force within the residents that they just met last night for the second time. We're meeting again next week um, to discuss this exact issue: is is how are we gonna how are we going to let the the students at large understand our program? And what what we plan to offer is uh, probably a once monthly. We'll probably start in in late late this month. I have one in July, one in August, one in September, uh, which will be uh, basically an, an open Zoom uh, type of meeting where we'll have faculty intro introduce the, the programs, the offerings, the mechanics of the program, where you rotate, um, what, what we're interested in, the opportunities for research, the opportunities uh, that, you know, that we've just described. Uh, but this would be, uh, I hate to use the term infomercial, but it would be a, a bit of an infomercial for, for the program but it allows us to, to be exposed to all of the, the great talent out there. And it also allows the talent to be able to say, okay, this sounds like a great program for me. I, I'm interested in applying. I'm interested in maybe doing a virtual clerkship. I think on a more intimate level, as uh, Alice was just, um, just describing and, and uh, others have alluded to with the virtual clerkships, we're, we're looking at having the ability to have uh, a small group of people who actually apply for a visiting clerkship attend any of our Zoom conferences, any of our Zoom uh, patient conferences, but then have a dedicated session on a nightly basis where you'll actually have a session with residents, a number of attendings with no more than let's say 10 prospective students. So it's intimate enough that, that we can get to know you on a personal level. I think that's probably the, the the best that we can do in, in this situation in lieu of uh, having in-person in -person clerkships. Great, thank you. Uh, and similar question, uh, Stacy, is how can you learn about, how can students learn about the culture of the program without actually being there? What resources, recommendations, and tips do you have for them? 
So I, I think that's something that all of us are trying to figure out how to best um, advertise and really let uh, students know who we are on a personal level. Um, and truthfully, the reason for that is especially because we, you know, when we're thinking about res people coming to train as residents with us is that we really do want it to be a very good fit. In other words, we want residents that are going to thrive in our program, wherever it is, uh, we want residents that are going to do very well. So that issue of sort of whether or not um, it's a good it's a good fit from a culture standpoint is very important. Um, I always think that really the residents are actually the best um, people to really access in this way. And I think that um, what we're trying to do this year, since we won't be able to interact in real life, is to figure out how to do that on a virtual level. And I think we're going to learn a lot, actually. So I think over the summer, as we get more comfortable with this, I think we're going to find ways to try to do that. But I certainly know uh, that in our program, our residents um, are always very invested in actually trying to meet students, and they're very willing to have those conversations. And questions that you might not ask in this format or you might not be comfortable asking and attending, you're much more likely to ask a resident that's currently in a training program. So um, I do think that, you know, we're all trying to do a better job of increasing our online presence and social media. And I think certainly um, those accounts that are managed by residents and seeing what they post and how they post, that's a very quick way to really sort of get a little bit of a sense. But I think programs that offer an opportunity to really interact with residents on a personal level, either by email or by phone, those are the, that's really, I think, where you're going to get the best sense of really what's happening on it within the program. Great. And I'll just take this uh, time um, as the moderator to take a moment of uh, personal privilege in this and to, put, to, to discourage students from using some um, of those online chat rooms and um, posting sites that may talk about programs. I think a lot of misinformation gets uh, delivered in those spaces. And so just be really cautious as to where you get your information from and try to identify sources uh, that are actually gonna speak to the true heart of the program, specifically residents, past trainees, uh, and faculty. Um, sure, very similar question uh, is, you know, is there value uh, for uh, students to be reaching out to those residents and, and program directors and other faculty and if so how do you go about doing so how do you make those connections so so I agree with uh, Stacy that you know there is a great benefit in finding out about the culture of a program by talking to the residents um, uh, obviously when you're looking at a, a newer program like ours we have interns you can talk to them but you know we, we're fortunate to have the mass sign or senior residents uh, still on service with us uh, so it's it's a great opportunity to find out how different institutions work and how uh, they go about it. Obviously, in this day and age, uh, virtual visits uh, will work. We are also working on uh, getting some, uh, virtual seminars and how to get people in uh, virtually into uh, for the residents uh, for the candidates to have an idea of the inner workings of the program. Uh, for the for the faculty, obviously, uh, you can usually set up an appointment if you want to chat about it. But we'll be setting up uh, up uh, Q and A sessions with the faculty. Uh, on a regular basis over the summer. And again, this is a learning experience for all of us. Uh, I think that's a common theme we're, we, we, we're hearing today. Uh, we'll set up the Q&A session so that uh, the, uh, the students can uh, get an idea of uh, where we are coming from, what our goals are for education, and how we intend to make those uh, uh, residents successful. Uh, the residents, obviously, as, uh, as we've heard, are, are an important part of that, uh, and that can be set up as well. Uh, so I think it is an invaluable source of information to understand the inner workings of any program. Great, and, and, and Alice, I wanna to turn to you for this question because um, you know we have a lot of students who apply from across the country uh, to the Harvard Affiliated Residency Programs. And oftentimes there isn't necessarily that tie, right? Where uh, there isn't someone who's coming from that uh, medical school or from that region who, come, who comes uh, to uh, Boston for their training. And so, you know, a lot of students are uncomfortable with this. And how can students really show their genuine interest uh, and not make it look as if they're just shotgun applying to every program that's out there and really show that there's a targeted interest in a particular program? Yeah. Um, oh, oh, I'm on. Um, so I think the... I would say first to reassure everyone, we do read every application that comes through us. So we don't have any screens on numbers or screens on geographic locations or screens on medical school. Everyone who applies to us, we read all of their applications. Um, so that's an, the, the first important thing to know. I think 
um, having a faculty member reach out on your behalf um, and reach out to the program director of a program they're interested in is very appropriate. I would only do that to one or two programs. You Most surgical subspecialties are small programs, and so you don't want to reach out to all 10 places that you're somewhat interested in and say that, that you're very interested in them because that will sort of come back to haunt you later on. Um, but I think it's very appropriate to have someone reach out on your behalf to one or two places that you're particularly interested in. You want to do that before interviews are given out. So off, often programs are sort of boxed in once they've handed out interviews. So earlier on in the season, if there's a couple of places that you would really like to interview in, I would reach out to those places early. Great, thank you. Um, you know, Chris, this is a question that I've seen a few times in, in the Q&A and, in, and we've heard it before in prior webinars. You know, students, uh, especially with these three uh, subspecialties that we're talking about, don't necessarily get a chance to uh, do rotations uh, in the subspecialties, but specifically, a lot of students have actually had their time impacted in third year uh, where they didn't necessarily get to complete uh, their surgical or their, uh, or their internal medicine residency. Uh, and some schools have actually switched to pass fail um, as opposed to grades, um, uh, especially during this time of COVID. Uh, so how will residency programs look at this disruption of medical education uh, for those who are gonna be applying this application season? Yeah, I, I noted that question before and I'm glad that, you, that I'm getting a chance to answer it. Um, I don't think it's gonna be uh, a very, very impactful. And the reason for that is, is we understand that across the board, uh, that, that things have changed. Um, it's, it's not going to be the, the, the same type of uh, scrutiny to, you know, unless you've had an honors in an orthopedic rotation or an honors in your, in your uh, surgery rotation or whatever it is that, that, that we feel is, is the usual complement of, of honors in, in certain uh, rotations within the medical school years. It's going to be a little bit different. Now, we've, we're already used to certain medical schools only have pastel, and there, is, there, there are no honors grades, so it's, it's not that much of a stretch that we'd be moving and, and being more accommodating for it. So I, I wouldn't get very held up on it, and, and quite frankly, it's out of your control. You've, you, if, 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 your, if your medical school has moved to a pastel, it, it's, that, that's going to be something that we know. It's going to be explained. And the way we do our our selection process when we go through the the applications, the, the same we, we try to give um, all of the applications or a large bulk of the applications from a single institution to a single reviewer, so that they're not mixing apples and oranges. You you see the transcript from let's say everybody from UPenn, and you're looking at all of those applications together, and you see everything everybody from UPenn has a pass fail for surgery, pass fail from for internal medicine and that and that way it it's it's not that you're standing out because you have a pass fail amongst everybody else who's had an honors great thank you um and stacy a similar question uh we're thinking about students uh in this space where their timing is off and some students have either had shortened rotations or they haven't actually had a chance to do their advanced elective or their sub eyes we've talked about virtual electives um is there anything that students need to sort of have as a must-have uh, in their application um, uh, before uh, so, uh, before the application process begins? So um, for otolaryngology specifically, we really, I think, rely most on the otolaryngology rotation at the home institution as far as, um, as, far as the really sort of the core clinical experience. We do want to see sort of um, the evaluation from both medicine and surgery because otolaryngology has combinations of both in what we do. Um, but I think one of the things that we really do, and, and partly because the actual release of the applications is going to be later this season, it actually, I think most places will at least have the ability to have an otolaryngology rotation at their home institution, which is really sort of what we're looking at the most. But the Dean's Letter, I think, really is something that we all utilize when we're reviewing applications. And what the Dean's Letter does is it really picks out personal characteristics, which are usually comments from rotations. Um, so even in the absence of grades, we're really able to get a sense of professionalism, collaboration, how people work within teams, which are honestly the... Um, sort of the personality characteristics that we're really um, looking for. And I don't think that that will change dramatically, even with all of the issues related to COVID. So I'm not as concerned about that. And I think what we won't see is just away rotations, but everybody is, um, you know, having that situation this year. So 
everyone's applications will look the same in that sense. Great. Similar question for you, Alice. Um, as uh, a program director, how are you going to assess students uh, without away rotations um, and the letters that typically come from them? Because that's usually a sought after commodity for students is those away rotations to, to validate um, uh, them as uh, strong applicants. Yeah, I would just echo what Stacy said, um, which is that we know that there is going to be a lack of opportunity to do away rotations and everyone will be in the same boat with that. I think it will make the letters of recommendation that come from your home institution even more important. And to speak to that, I think it'll make, um, you know, having a letter from someone who knows you very well, um, as opposed to someone who's maybe more prominent in the field, I think even that will be more important because what we're going to be trying to get at this year is sort of who are you? And we'll have less information. So the more depth of information we have, the better off we are. So it's something to think about when you when you pick your letter writers. Um, I think there's also the opportunity to put um, into your personal statements some information about things you might have, you think might have restricted or limited your application this year. So if there are particular circumstances that happened to you, you planned on doing an away rotation in a certain place and you couldn't, or you had a particular plan for research and it didn't work because of COVID or you know, circumstances like that, you should explain them in the personal statement because I think, again, that will give us some more context and understanding of who you are and where you're coming from. Thank you. And Sharuk, um, letters of recommendation, um, can you talk about those as well? And specifically, um, any recommendations for students to secure strong letters of recommendation? What are you looking for um, in a letter that's going to speak to you and, um, and how can students uh, go about identifying the, the right individuals to ask? I think the important thing here is uh, uh, the, the rotation at the home institution, which we've heard. Uh, that's become very important. Uh, we, we are always looking for a letter of recommendation from your program director uh, and or your uh, chief or chair of your department. Uh, you need to work with them to get a strong letter of recommendation. I think uh, familiarity is important, doing a good job on your rotation. A lot of rotations have uh, 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 talks that you have to give. So make sure you guys spend time on that and not take it lightly. I think uh, being able to show that you can work with a resident group becomes important because they do have an input in these letters. Uh, so I think having a good relationship. Besides that, uh, this is obviously a time of virtual work. So you can always do virtual research nowadays uh, with people uh, in another institution where you might want to go. You'll have to reach out and figure those things out and those can become a, a letter writer if you do a good job. Uh, otherwise, you look for another person in, in your department or your division if you have a local uh, ordering audio program uh, who can write you a strong letter. I think that's important to have that discussion. Uh, you must have spent time with that person. Uh, I think there's a mistake that happens where you end up asking for a letter from someone even though you have not spent time with them uh, and then that letter becomes very lukewarm. So I think familiarity, doing something with the letter writer uh, that will help them along to know you better is critical in getting a strong letter. And those letters from the pro program directors and the, and the chiefs and chairs is very important or someone who runs your medical student education rotation, uh, someone uh, that, uh, that has sway over your education will become very important. Great, thank you for that. And Chris, I wanna to come to you uh, for a question. Um, we're gonna be reading personal statements. Uh, what should students be including in those personal statements? And then I guess as an aside, uh, with everyone impacted by COVID, I'm sure people are gonna to wanna to talk about that. Uh, should that be something that's included or you know should they stay away from having conversations related to COVID? Yeah I, I think that um, what, what you don't want to do is what everybody else is doing and you know I, I would speak about COVID if if you feel like that has absolutely defined your decision to go into orthopedics or to within orthopedics to, to direct you in some in, in, in some direction. Um, the same thing with the, the personal statement in general. I, I would tell you what's, what's very, what's very uh, overused is I had an injury, I tore my ACL, I played sports, and I loved orthopedics after that because I wanted to be like my orthopedic surgeon. And I, and I hate to be you know, so flippant with that, but that, that's, that's gonna be overlooked. What's, what's not gonna be overlooked is something that's truly personal about you. What is, what is it that makes you passionate, truly passionate about orthopedics? Uh, that's gonna separate you. It's gonna be something that, uh, that, that someone's gonna remember. And that's what you really want, is when we're going through applications, um, 
who who's gonna who's gonna remember? Oh, do you remember? Them? We may not even remember your name, but it's gonna be. Do you remember that story about the the, the kid who just he brought his brother up and his sister and he he was on his own. that's what we're going to remember is something truly personal and, and impactful and, and and why that relates to your decision to go into orthopedics great thank you and i think it's really important to recognize both words about uh in that is it's personal and it is a statement so make sure that you are sharing your story and it makes a statement about who you are as a person uh you know stacy I've, I've seen this question a few times in, in the q a um Students are concerned about either uh, a not so strong uh, step one score or a, a lukewarm evaluation during third year. Um, how can students uh, overcome those with perceived def deficiencies in their application and still be successful in the match process? So I think um, regarding step one scores, uh, this year is a little bit more complicated just because um, being able to take step two has been impacted obviously, but um, certainly in the past, uh, a, a stronger performance on step two is definitely a way uh, to sort of um, eliminate concerns about the step one score. I think the other is simply um, not ignoring it. So one of the things is really, I, I think the, I, and I also wanted to say just in general, one of the most important things throughout this process is mentorship. And I think every student should have someone that they can access a ment as a mentor at their own institution that can look at their application and help them on a personal level because all of us have issues that maybe there's a little bit of a struggle. And for instance, a letter writer can very frankly address a step score um, that is something that does not then reflect on your performance um, as far as being an excellent clinician and an excellent future otolaryngologist. And that really, I think, is going to be um, probably the most important thing. So it's different for every person and certainly performance on an otolaryngology rotation and a good evaluation there is more important than performance on internal medicine or surgery, although we do look at the entire application. An extremely strong um, performance in your field and strong letters of recommendation are ultimately going to be what is most important. And our program also similar to what Dr. Lorch said, we don't have a cutoff for board scores. Um, so we, we really do, we recognize that board scores are actually a very poor indicator of ability to be a good clinician. And unfortunately, and that's part of the reason why they're going away in the future. And I think it will, it will allow us to ignore that even more and hopefully again, holistically review applications um, as well. So I think that it's not something to get too caught up on. And again, frank conversations with your mentor will help navigate that. Great, thank you for that. And uh, Sharuk, um, as we sort of continue this conversation around uh, exams and step scores, um, unfortunately, uh, there's been a lot of, uh, um, I guess, just scheduling errors, missteps that have happened with, for students who are trying to schedule step two uh, specifically CK. We know that CS is uh, going to be uh, tabled for, for the year. Um, what should students do uh, in this space when it comes to um, trying to make sure that they have a step two score ahead of the application uh, season or should they be contacting programs as soon as they take their exam and they get their score back? Any thoughts about how students should prepare when it comes to step two exams? So, Arden, uh, uh, so this is a difficult year, obviously, and, uh, and we know in, in, uh, in the upcoming future, step one will be going away. Uh, so in general, if we were not in this uh, time period, uh, you know, you can take your, if you have a really good, uh, a, a good uh, application with a good step score, uh, even though, you know, we don't look at uh, or, or try to not look at the step one scores to get interviews and all, we're looking at the whole application. Uh, if you have a good score, then yes, you can uh, stay back on the step two score. Uh, step two, taking the step two. The only thing is, uh, in at least in the state of Massachusetts, I'm assuming most states work like that. You need the step two score to get at least a limited license for uh, for residency. So you'll have to do it at some point in time. How you time it uh, is up to the candidate. Now, having said that, this year, as you said, the step two CS, uh, we don't know. It's tabled for at least 18 months. I think the Board of Registration hasn't given us a direction how this is going to impact uh, new residents, especially the ones coming in for next year. Uh, this year's are in the process. 
so, but step two, if done appropriately, can augment your application. Uh, it can, you know, polish off a, a, a good application. It may help an application that may be average. Uh, and we like to see that bump in, in the scores. Uh, a lot of program records do that. Uh, going down in your step two score, maybe some people may consider it as a, uh, 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 as a concern. But for the most part, if you, it's uh, your whole application that matters at the end of the day. Uh, and this year, I think it's an evolving thing, like we said, with COVID and a lot of testing centers closed. I, I heard there was a bunch of testing centers that opened up in, in Massachusetts, uh, but uh, but it, it's gonna be a struggle this year, how, how this is gonna get done. Uh, but overall, in a regular year, it can help you if you need to, but uh, it has to be done before you graduate. Great. Um, you know, another phase of this uh, process is the interviews, um, and so, uh, Alice, as a program director, how are you preparing um, for virtual interviews? Yeah, so our interviews will be um, entirely virtual, and, and I think the vast majority of ophthalmology programs will do the same, according to what I'm hearing across the country in response to the ACGME recommendations. To be totally honest, I think this is a great change and something that I've wanted to happen for a long time personally. I think that there's... Um, a lot of problems with medical students spending all sorts of money to travel across the country to see our programs. And I think there's a way that we can do this well virtually. So I'm sort of excited about it. I think that the onus is sort of on us as programs to, to provide information to you so that you get to know us. I wouldn't want anyone to feel uncertain about joining our program or coming to live in Boston because of a lack of information, a lack of familiarity. And so I think we feel sort of the weight of that. But people are taking it really seriously. Um, we'll be doing things like, you've heard a lot of the things that, that are sort of in the works, but um, I think we'll be hosting informational webinars, we'll make, be making virtual tours of our hospital, virtual tours of the city, um, we'll be doing a lot more on social media than we were doing before. Um, there's a big push from the ophthalmology um, national committees to provide more transparent data on our um, the SF match, which is where you apply for residency through um, for ophthalmology, and so there'll be more surgical numbers that are available now than have ever been before. Um, so it's it's a big push from the side of the programs. I think it's a great opportunity to increase the transparency about the program and also save a lot of time and money, hopefully, for the medical students. Great. Yeah, I agree. It's a costly um, process, so hopefully uh, this is going to be helpful for the students. Um, but Stacey, along those lines, students may be uncomfortable sitting in front of a computer uh, and doing an interview. What can students do to prepare for these um, virtual interviews? So I think one thing is that my suspicion is that many medical schools will actually probably have some sessions on this. And if they don't, I think it's something that students should reach out to the medical school to ask for help in this regard. Um, normally at our, at our uh, medical school, um, we have residents that actually sort of do mock interviews for students that are currently applying. And I know that that is something that is extremely helpful. And my suspicion is that if you're in a school where there are there's a residency program, even spontaneously asking the residents to help in that regard and to do it virtually is something that um, they would be more than willing to help with. I think program directors will probably be more, more than willing to help with that too. We have gotten used to this actually um, just because most of our fellowship interviews have moved to virtual during the, during the COVID epidemic. And so I think that um, we, we are much more comfortable with the actual format. And so I think the concept of practicing is probably the way really for students to, um, to students to get help with that. The other thing is that I think for most specialties, the national organizations are really trying to help with that too. So the American Academy of Otolaryngology is um, planning to host webinars related to this for students as well. And um, even though our national meeting this year has been canceled, we actually have an entire session for specifically geared towards underrepresented uh, minorities. And this is going to be an area where there will be a breakout session with program directors. And I have a feeling this will also be covered uh, very nicely there as well. So I think for all of the specialties, there will probably be some national um, sort of reach out from the different societies to, to help students in this regard as well. But I think practicing is probably the best way. Great. And uh, Chris, something that um, has uh, various meetings for various programs is conversations and communication with programs during uh, the open application cycle. Students may get uh, waitlisted or not offered an interview and they want to reach out to a program or they interview at a program and they want to communicate with the program afterwards. Um, can you talk about uh, sort of your thoughts and feelings uh, about uh, communication um, outside of the application process? 
Yeah, it's always um, an interesting subject uh, as we, as a program, would like to express our interest in certain candidates um, and, and certainly would like to receive that, that feedback from a candidate who is particularly interested. I think as far as just general communications, uh, there's never a reason that you can't reach out uh, to any of the associate program directors or our program director, Dr. Dyer. Um, we, for the uh, virtual away clerkships, we're going to try to set, to set up a mentorship program so that you'll actually have one contact person within the program as far as one faculty and one resident person so that you can have a, uh, some type of, of uh, relationship and communication along those lines. Um, but, you know, staying within the, the, the match rules is always the, uh, the key as you can never tell somebody where they're, where they're ranked. Um, um, but uh, I, I think reaching out to uh, to each other on both sides and letting letting know mutual interests is, is always something that that can and should be done. Great. And so this is a question I actually have for all the panelists, and hopefully it gets a little bit more to the culture of our institutions. Um, and I'll go with uh, I'll go to you first, Stacy. Um, when you think about your residents and how they've been impacted by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, how did they respond? Um, what were your thoughts about um, uh, how the program itself responded and also how the institution supported the trainees during this uh, troubling time? So I think one of the things that, you know, that I learned um, the most uh, is that first is that all programs need to have an emergency plan. So I think we've never faced something like this before and specifically concerns related to keeping our trainees safe as far as from an infection standpoint. Um, we very quickly implemented a lot of things to make sure that all of the trainees really felt very safe, that they had appropriate PPE and that they were supported. Um, I think because Boston was obviously impacted pretty significantly with the number of, of patients that were here, as a surgical subspecialty, one of the things we dealt with was um, the idea of um, residents helping in other areas. And I will just simply say that I could not be more proud of my residents and how willing they were to just um, pitch in and um, ultimately do things that are outside of their comfort zone, but with supervision. And I think really the biggest message is that they all are physicians at their core and want to care for patients. And um, although obviously it has interrupted their otolaryngology specific training, I think they have learned absolutely valuable lessons as far as being a well-rounded physician. So, and I think that's true across Boston. I think that's one of the things that I have really seen is just the way all of the Harvard hospitals responded to this uh, was really pretty amazing. And I think it's in part because our residents were really willing to just pitch in and do what needed to get done to care for patients. Great, and uh, maybe I'll go to you next, Alice, for the same question. I mean, I would echo everything Stacy said. I don't have to repeat it. Stacy and I actually worked very closely with all of our residents during this process. Um, I think on top of just demonstrating amazing resilience and willingness to help and, and sort of that core of being a physician, I was very impressed by the, the innovation that our, our, our um, residents displayed during this process. And so they really thought critically about the situation our hospital is in, and they came up with, with ideas that um, helped our 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 COVID plan. So for an example, they decided to set up a triage hotline so that patients could call in before coming into our emergency room to decide whether they needed to come in and have that kind of exposure. Um, they set up virtual training platforms for medical students. They were involved in um, sort of virtual telemedicine visits. And so they've really been um, not only sort of doing their job and, and, and supporting in many ways, but going above and beyond that and, and being innovative and, and helping the, the recovery plan um, of the hospital in this sort of unique times. It's been very impressive. Great. Um, and before we go to uh, uh, you, Sharuk, on this, I'm seeing a couple messages from students in uh, the questions. And we're going to, one of the slides that we're going to put up towards the end is contact information in places that uh, students can get uh, a hold of us for email addresses. So if you just hold on, we'll get to that slide and we'll put it up. Uh, but for you, Sharuk, uh, similar question. Um, thoughts about how uh, your residents performed during this time and how the hospital supported them? 
So I think uh, Stacy's uh, mentioned that because we are we, we are the same program uh, um, for the residents. The residents rotating through PI. Uh, so I think Stacy had put in a good a good a good plan for the residents to be safe. We as hospitals had responded uh, in following the principles on uh, keeping the residents protected. Number one, so uh, we do not have them interact with uh, COVID nineteen patients. Uh, it was uh, strictly by attendings and our advanced practitioners who have worked tirelessly. The residents on the ha hand were great. They, they, they went through this process well. They helped out wherever they could uh, to help with the patients. I think the clinical care was excellent. I think all of us uh, have learned a lot how we can rely on each other to get through these uh, pandemics. And I agree that uh, uh, every residency program needs to have a contingency plan if something like this hits again. I, I hope to never see it in my lifetime. Uh, but if this happened, we specifically at Beth Israel got hit really hard, as you know, Arden, uh, with uh, COVID patients. So I think we've learned a lot uh, as, a, as a full service general hospital. Uh, and uh, we've kept people safe through it. So And the residents uh, just uh, performed brilliantly. Uh, I could not be more thankful to them for what they did. Uh, so that's my thing for the residents. Great. And I'll go to you just to close out this question. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll echo all of those comments. I could not be any more proud of what our residents, uh, how, how our residents handled this crisis. You know, at, at first glance, you think, what's, what's an orthopedic resident going to do in the midst of a respiratory disease? Our orthopedic residents, number one, uh, immediately organized themselves so that they protected a cohort of, of residents at home um, with two-week rotations uh, as, as, so that we maintain essential orthopedic services in the hospital. They were asked to cover the emergency room and they did that splendidly. Um, they volunteered to, uh, to, to serve at Boston Hope, which is, uh, you know, for, for those of you who are not in Boston, this is a field hospital that was set up at a convention center. They, they did this above and beyond. They weren't asked to do this, they volunteered. Um, and they did this uh, across the board. So uh, I, I'm, I was amazed at, at the response that, that they had. And, and now we're, we're seeing the, the positivity of that response come back to them. They developed such a strong bond, bond with the emergency room physicians and, um, and residents that they're, they're still thanking them profusely for the service that they gave um, during this COVID crisis. So uh, they, you know, a program director couldn't be any more proud of, of their performance and the response to it. Great. And uh, I think just given the interest of time, this is where we'll stop. And I just want to say uh, a big thank you to our panelists, uh, Dr. Lorch, Dr. Jalisi, Dr. Bono, and Dr. Gray uh, for joining us and um, bringing uh, your thoughts as a program director uh, to this space. Um, Fari, if you can bring up the slides, please. Um, for those of you who are having questions uh, about uh, reaching out to us, we're going to post this information on our website, dicp.hms.harvard.edu. More information will be available for, for then. For those of you who have colleagues who are interested in applying to OBGYN residencies, we're going to be doing a similar webinar on June 23rd uh, at noon. Um, we have some contact information from a few of our programs. We're going to be putting more information about those uh, visiting uh, virtual visiting clerkships and rotations um, um, on our website as well. And so if you have questions, you can reach out to us directly and we can point you in the direction of the right program directors. Uh, if you would like to reach out to us directly, there's some contact information. Um, Fari, do we have a quick um, poll for the uh, participants to uh, click on?